Robotech debuted in 1985, ushering in a new era of animation driven by dramatic, emotional, soap operatic storytelling, a combination of style, dynamic visuals, and real emotional consequence previously unknown to the American television audience. 1986 was set to be the year that Robotech advanced to the next level, connecting with an even bigger audience, tackling the box office, and forever cementing its place in mainstream pop culture. Hi, I'm Dan Larson, and this is the History of Robotech, Part 2. <laughs> This is the History of Robotech Part 2. If you haven't watched our Part 1 video yet, you might want to check that out and come back to this one. Spoiler alert, I talk about things in this video that happened after that video chronologically. After Robotech Season 1 aired in 1985, producers Harmony Gold could see that they had a nominal success and they needed to follow that up with something. Something bigger, something that advanced the story, that grew the mythology, something that would allow them to partner with a toy manufacturer and really start to move some money around these bank accounts. Harmony Gold had always been in the film licensing business, not the toy business. Their production of Robotech had never truly been about selling toys. It was about establishing Japanese animation in America and becoming the biggest source. They had always directed Robotech at teens and young adults, but at this point, it would be bad business not to at least try to get some big-time toys moving. No offense to the previous releases by Matchbox. Heck, following the model of the Japanese market where all of this stuff had already been tested and worked, that's the way you do it. The toy company is the one sponsoring the development of the animation to be produced in the first place. Without Takatoku Toys, there is no Macross to begin with. It cannot become Robotech. Season 2 was put into production, and unlike their previous re-editing of existing animation, Harmony Gold was actually producing brand new, original animation in continuation of the specific stories and characters that they had developed through the first season of Robotech. And on top of that, Harmony Gold worked out a distribution deal with Canon Films to start work on a feature-length production. Canon Films, the people who brought you Highlander, Superman for the Quest for Peace, Masters of the Universe, and Mannequin. Check this out, check this out, check this out. Rockula, the love story that rocks. Carl Masek, the driving creative force at Harmony Gold, the man behind the existence of Robotech in America, wanted to do a straight dub of the Japanese-produced feature, The Super Dimension Fortress Macross, Do You Remember Love? That's a heck of a title, which had been released one year prior in 1984 in Japan. Do You Remember Love, for short, was essentially an anniversary or compressed retelling of the entire 39-episode original Macross series that had aired in Japan in 1982. Tatsunoko Productions, however, really kind of wanted Harmony Gold to just, you know, back off with the whole making a movie thing out of concerns about the utilization of elements of Macross that might be confusing to audiences and interfere with the ongoing promotion and merchandising of their own film, Do You Remember Love?, since all the designs are the same. Originally, Masek wanted the film to be set on Earth while the SDF-1 was on its way back from Pluto, with protagonist Mark Landry, a relative of Rick Hunter's, finding out about the disappearance of the SDF-1 and the government cover-up and trying to make that information public. The film was moved in the timeline to after the end of the first season and before the premiere of the second season to appease Tatsunoko's requests about using design or story elements from Macross. And to further muddy the international legal waters, Takatoku Toys, the company that created the Valkyrie toy, or Veritech as it's known in Robotech, went out of business in 1984 before Harmony Gold was even able to get Robotech Season 1 on the air in 1985. When Takatoku closed, their assets were sold off to various companies. Bandai purchased a majority of the designs, but Hasbro was able to purchase the rights to the most important, the most iconic piece, the Valkyrie, and turned it into Jetfire. Hasbro's use of the Valkyrie mold was the first time that Harmony Gold took legal action to enforce its license as the only legal owner of that design and any designs related to Macross in the U.S. Hasbro could no longer sell the Valkyrie mold, but Harmony Gold also couldn't buy it from them. Harmony Gold wasn't big enough to commission the creation of a new original animated series and an original feature-length animated film. They were forced to rely on their old ways of utilizing pre-existing animation, re-editing, redubbing, and repackaging them as Robotech. Carl Masek decided to use footage from a show called Megazone 2-3 the same way he had used footage from Macross, Southern Cross, and Mospita in the creation of Robotech Season 1. Canon Films, however, was not impressed by the original cut Carl presented featuring the Megazone footage. Too much women talking, not enough robots shooting. 
crying out loud, Carl, we are canon films. We made Enter the Ninja, Revenge of the Ninja, Ninja 3 The Domination, American Ninja, American Ninja 2, American Ninja 3 Blood Hunt, American Ninja 4 The Annihilation, American Ninja 5. We are very professional movie people with the skills to roll out hit after hit after hit. You don't do four sequels because no one's watching, right, Carl? <laughs> Canon gave Carl 24 hours to make a completely new film that met their requirements. More guns, more robots, more shooting, less girls talking and eating hamburgers. I warned you! I tell you! Canon was not going to put that Robotech movie in the same portfolio as hits like Life Force, Cobra, Delta Force, The Exterminator 2, and Death Wish 2. This is the danger you run into when you're trying to build a story, a brand, around pre-existing material and not creating the animation to meet your story needs. Deadline looming, Carl grabbed footage from Super Dimension Cavalry Southern Cross, a series he had already used in the creation of the second era of Robotech Season 1. At least there was some visual consistency. Carl knew this was no way to create a thing, certainly no way to create a feature film that had any chance of survival at the box office. Forget the quick turnaround, the fact that Southern Cavalry footage was 16mm and the Megazone 2-3 footage was 35mm was going to be glaringly obvious on screen. In his words, he knew, quote, it was going to look crappy when it was blown up. The thing with Megazone 2-3 was that it was a three-part thing originally in Japan, and Carl only had access to the first part, so there was no definitive ending, and naturally, Canon didn't care for the way the film ended, obviously, because there was no existing ending that made sense to cut into the film. Canon should know, after all, they made Rappin', Breakin', and Breakin' 2 Electric Boogaloo. Crack House, the hottest subject in America. So Canon commissioned a completely original ending to the Megazone 2-3 story for the film that exists only as part of Robotech the movie, a weird soup of Megazone 2-3 Southern Cross and new stuff. Robotech the movie premiered in about 30 theaters in the Dallas metro area in July of 1986. It had been marketed as continuing the adventures of all your favorite characters from Robotech. History shows that it did not perform well, and history provides enough blame to be shared by several parties. Don't push. There's enough here for everyone. Television ads only ran at 6 a.m., you know, when teenagers and young adults are most likely to be watching television. Robotech fans were disappointed that the characters they loved, all of their favorites, weren't in it. Parents groups were appalled by the graphic violence and mature themes, not just violence, but sexual assault. After the premiere, Canon pulled their marketing budget and stopped running ads since they weren't getting the kid audience that they had been promoting the film to in the first place, contrary to the teens and young adults that Carl Masek was making the film for. But hey, the movie didn't work out. That doesn't mean that season two can't still be a huge success building a stronger Robotech for the future. With Matchbox Toys as a partner, Harmony Gold had the second season of Robotech called Robotech The Sentinels, firing on all cylinders. 85 episodes were planned. It was all brand new animation, a new dawn for the franchise, severing their dependence on pre-existing animated material imported from Japan, finally, truly continuing the adventures of all your favorite characters. But the governments of the world literally got in the way. In 1985, at the Plaza Hotel in New York City, the Plaza Accord was signed by the then G5 nations, United States, France, West Germany, Japan, and the United Kingdom. The purpose was to intentionally devalue the dollar against other international currencies due to trade imbalances that were overly aggressively profitable for the United States, but dangerously detrimental to economic growth everywhere else on the planet. This directly affected the dollar against the yen, which meant that paying animators in Japan to make your new robot cartoon suddenly cost nearly twice as much since the dollar was now worth half what it used to be. Matchbox decided that it wasn't that interested in this particular brand of robot toys and pulled their budget despite the fact that Robotech Season 2 The Sentinels was already sold to 65% of American households. Harmony Gold alone did not have the funds to continue to finance the production, and that left season two with only three episodes completed, dead in the water. Carl did what Carl does and recut those three episodes into a mini film which was released direct to video. Carl and his crew continued to produce Robotech stuff that would hopefully draw the attention of another toy company, but the window had closed. 
Carl would leave Harmony Gold in 1987 to go to Deke Entertainment to help develop other animated series like Cops, which aired in 1988 to 1989, with Carl writing several episodes and acting as the story editor. In 1988, Carl Masek, Fred Patton, and Jerry Beck founded Streamline Pictures, a company that would spend the next 14 years importing and dubbing anime from Japan, uncut from their original source material. My Neighbor Totoro, Kiki's Delivery Service, Akira Lensman, Fist of the North Star, Vampire Hunter D, hit after hit after hit. Isn't that ironic? It was the end of Carl Masek's Robotech journey, but not the end for Robotech, which will continue in the history of Robotech. Part three. Thanks for watching. Please hit like, hit subscribe. If you're not already a subscriber, share this video with everyone who is still steaming mad at Harmony Gold. If you're in the position to help the channel grow, please check out our Patreon, patreon.com slash toy galaxy. We are currently in the process of assembling History of Robotech part three from old episodes of Toy Galaxy, and we'll be releasing that direct to video. Might want to hit eBay and get yourself a VHS if you don't still have one. It's gonna be good stuff. Cut.